And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, a, ma a man a r who is a writer, a historical fencer, a fr an old school game master, and soon the creator of the upcoming Dawn of the Necromancer adventure, the one and only John Harmston. How you do? How you doing today, man? Great. Thanks for having me, Mildra. Thank Thank you for Thank you for coming on. So. A bit of a tradition around here is to open with the humble beginnings. With that in mind, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what was it that made it stick? Sure. So, the uh, the year was 1982, and I was a young lad being uh, babysat uh, by uh, a teenage guy, and he said, hey, have you heard of this new game, Dungeons and & Dragons? And uh, I think I had heard of it. But anyways, he gave me an introduction to it. It was the, you know, back in those days, it was like the second version of basic Dungeons & Dragons and advanced Dungeons & Dragons was out. And so he kind of walked me through a, a one-shot adventure mm. and... I was just, you know, blown away. Like it completely captured my imagination. And uh, I, I I just thought it was the coolest thing ever. And so, uh, you know, I kind of eventually bullied some neighbor kids into playing with me. Uh, I talked the, that babysitter into taking me, you know, a couple of years later to my first con where I could, you know, play it uh with adults at the time and you know i'm sure i was just uh the annoying kid at the table uh but everybody I just is ate first. it up what's up everybody is at first Every you gotta start somehow <laughs> yeah yeah exactly so uh yeah so that that started a lifelong love of the game and i you know moved to a new area uh, in upstate New York uh, at the time. And in high school, I was, uh, you know, I'd kind of gathered some friends who also played. And we would spend every Saturday at the public library. Uh, you know, we'd, we'd uh, reserve a room down in the basement mm -hmm. and play D&D &D and, and, and anything else the TSR was publishing and just had a blast. I mean, those were some of my fondest memories of... Uh, you know my youth. Yeah. Um, since since you mentioned anything else that TSR was publishing, um, I want I want to throw out some names and play a little bit of word association with you, just to just to see if some of these were on that were on that list at the time, or um, or if you were less familiar with some of these names. Okay. Star Frontiers. Oh yeah, played played a bunch of Star Frontiers. Loved it. All right. Um, Boot Hill. Boot Hill. I played a little bit of Boot Hill. Yes. Okay. Um, Indiana Jones. Um, I have a bunch of the of the books. I never, I never played it. Which, to be fair, isn't. To be fair, is you. Um, you didn't miss out on much. The <laughs> TSR Indiana Jones is not well. Is not well liked. Um. When a lot of people think of Indiana Jones and role playing, they think of the they're thinking of the West End version. The mm -hmm. problem with the Indiana Jones version is that it would it would they had thought, hey, let let's ha the people who want the people who want to pick up Indiana Jones want to play as the cast from the films, which not exactly the smartest move. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Buck Rogers. Uh, did not play it. All right, and as far as um, now I do want to get specific when it comes to mo when it comes to modules because there because there were a lot of um, sane and less sane set settings over over the years. So 
I'll con so this is the consider this the phase two of the lightning round. Um, Al Quadim. Uh, I I own them, and in fact, I probably own like all of the original modules. Like I've got a whole shelf just chuck full, but ne never played it. Yeah. Um, Dark Sun. Uh, I have played in the Dark Sun setting. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Um, here's here's the real bonkers one. Spelljammer. Spelljammer, I love. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I I really like Spelljammer. I I could totally build a campaign right now in that setting. I I, I really liked it. Yeah. Um. Dragonlance Fifth Age. Or e either of the two games from the uh, saga from that saga card system in the nineties. Uh no, did not play. All right. Um. Uh, Mar it, the technical the actual name for it is Marvel Superheroes, but everybody calls it Marvel Phase Rip. <laughs> yes, I yes, Marvel Superheroes. Uh, lots of fun, mm -hmm. lots of fun times with that. Yeah. Um. Truth be told, it's actually not too surprising that um, that Bu that Buck Rogers didn't get didn't get a whole lot of play, and um, most and the main reason I say that is because of some of the baggage behind behind that particular um, entry. I had mm -hmm. I had always I was always of the belief that if that was you if they had used the Buck Rogers IP as a backdoor pilot for a for a second edition of Star Frontiers, it probably would have done better. Because who the hell was going to know who Buck Rogers is in 1986? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, on, I only knew I only knew Buck Rogers as an occasional character I would see in really old in really old um, newspaper comic strips. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And, I mean, a big a big deal a big deal back in the back in the early pulp days, but not so not so much in the 80s. Yeah. Um, now when now when it came when it came to when it came to your your setup, especially at, especially after all the stuff that ended up going down with T, with TSR, um, did you largely stay within the D, within the D and D umbrella for for the for the years after, or did you br did you branch out into other um, game avenues over the years? So, um, yeah, so I, I, I played those games we discussed. Also, um, you know, some of the more obscure TSR stuff like mm -hmm. uh, Gangbusters, Top Secret, uh, I for, I and to, others. I forgot to mention Top Secret, which um, SI is the better version of that, I will admit. Right, right. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think I... I continued to play Dungeons and Dragons uh, quite a bit, but you know, also played some riffs and um, some more obscure stuff called uh, like the Morrow Project, Traveler, um, Adventures in Middle Earth, or uh, you know, Middle Earth role playing. Yeah, Merp. Um, and uh, yeah, so I mean, I, I I played on and off. For a number of years after college, I kind of, uh, you know, didn't have a, a, a really good gaming group, but uh, but eventually came uh, came back and uh, you know was playing some three five and then uh, Pathfinder mm -hmm. uh, for for quite a while until fifth edition came out and love fifth edition. Mm -hmm. um, now since I will I will note that um my my when since you mentioned riffs my sympathies for trying to for trying to make heads or heads or tails of the way the riffs books were organized. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not sure I'm not sure if you that, had the same was... I'm not sure if you had the same experience, but the times that I would run riffs, I had a um a book of house rules that was probably way too big to be just house rules. At some point, it started yes. being house rules, and it started becoming me design me designing the game from the ground up myself. 
it, it's funny you would say that because yeah i the same same thing here like it was it was some loosey goosey house rules were, were was basically the rule set mm. and then all the riffs books were just like uh you know uh it, cool equipment and uh powered armor you could use and rail guns and stuff it didn't exactly help that um Sim that Sim Beta has a habit of t of treating organized books like a suggestion and is the reason why ha the reason why even to this day I still have a giant stick up my ass about making about making sure that books are properly organized <laughs> right. yeah yeah that that can help for sure mm -hmm. so when it came when it comes to dawn of the necromancer which is a it, which is a 5e campaign um, 5e adventure. Um, was this a, was this an adventure that you were already do, already doing in one form or another th in um, previous editions, or do or does Dawn trace it, trace its origins a bit more recently? It, it's um uh you know there there's a couple ideas that that uh, I've been thinking about for a while, but for the most part, I basically um, had started it. Um, Prior to the pandemic, mm -hmm. uh, I, I I started writing it, and uh, just you know have just now completed it. So yep. now, one thing that one thing that definitely struck me, because this is not something I see all that often with um, adventures in general and with D and D adventures specifically, is the fact that you you are going from first level all the way to twentieth. And now, granted, that, now granted, I'm taking a broad brush when I say when I say that this isn't done all that often. But with a lot of both official and third party adventures, it's usually a set level or a set or a set range, and most of them don't go don't even go into the teens. Um, yeah. The only the only other big the only other big name I can think of that that has that has done the whole. Um, full extent for first to twentieth approach is En World with with some of their long with some of their long form campaigns like Zeitgeist or um, or War of the Burning Sky. Um, mm -hmm. What pr what prompted you to go? Did, was this or was this always planned <clears throat> to be a one through twenty adventure, or did the, or did that um, happen along development? Right. So the uh, when I originally conceived of the book, um, my idea was to kind of, you know, I, one, one of my goals is always to make fun, unusual combat encounters. And so whenever I would insert one of my own into a, you know, regular adventure, my, my players would always say, OK, this is this is clearly one of yours because, uh, you know, it, it's it's not it's not typical encounter, right? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so originally when I started the book, I had kind of envisioned a book of encounters, just you know, a bunch of encounters you could insert into a a, a broader campaign. And as I went along. I, I had a lot of you know neat ideas for NPCs and magic items and settings and and eventually it just started growing on me until it it became a campaign and I, I never at that point I had no doubt it was going to be one to twentieth because you know I wanted you to be able to start off with this you know fragile little flower at first level and eventually. You know, have the fun of taking that character all the way to twentieth level, mm -hmm. and all the all the shiny toys you get at that level. So when I when I did the play test, and you know, I took uh, pretty much a year to play test. I had two different groups run during that time, run all the way through from first to twentieth, and you know, granted, we we're playing on a weekly basis, and and uh, pushing hard to get through it. Mm. And then other I play tested with other groups just select encounters. But 
it, it was kind of fun because I, I don't know, I, I'd say probably half the people I played with are said, wow, this is super neat. This is the first time I've ever had a 20th level character. And, you know, I mean, that's like, that's, that's what it's all about. I mean, I think it's fun to have super powered characters, you know, and as long as you figure out how to balance the, those later encounters uh, and still make them feel challenging, you know, I, I think that's tons of fun. Yeah. It's definitely interesting that you'd go, that you'd go up that high because there's been, there's been a fair bit of contention throughout the, throughout the years and throughout various editions that, that um at a certain point, usually in the early teens, a lot of a lot of characters ki kind of peak, and mm -hmm. and in the same vein, there's the there's the notion that trying to make make really powerful characters would um would dis would dissuade from the tension. I often hear this kind of thing from um eight from A D and D Ardens, especially whenever I especially whenever I mention something on epic scale, like say Exalted. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I do, but I do think that it, I do think that it is certainly possible, and the and the presence of of old school games like Adventure Conqueror King System definitely demonstrate that. Now, given the given the fact that you oh that um you open the introduction on the Kickstarter page with the with the something ro something rotten line, which um made me smile. Um. <laughs> duh. Does Dawn of the, would you consider Dawn of the Necromancer to be ne to be necessarily a horror aligned um mo uh, module or would you would you say that it dip, that it dips into multiple styles? So I would say it's there's there's definitely horror themes involved and uh, however you know having played. Um, uh, and D well, DM'd Curse of Strahd mm -hmm. in in that case, which in that campaign, which I love, uh, you know, it is quite oppressively gothic and horror, you know, straight through for the most part. And uh, I I I tried to you know create also some light moments, some pulpy moments, some. Uh, you know, kind of try to change the pace up a little bit so that it wasn't just an oppressive, dark uh, theme running through the whole thing. If that makes sense. Yeah, I can. Cer I can certainly get. I can certainly get behind that. Now, when it comes now, um, one of the things that one of the things that st that stood out is. When you did the when you wrote the TLDR on the page, it talked about it talked about wanting to back the project for the bonkers encounters. Um, now I I am no I am no stranger to degrees of to degrees of bonkersness. I, mean, I've, um, <laughs> I have I have had I have had many a interest an interesting build come out of come out of the years of Gamma World, le least of which be, least of which being the angry the angry flower wielding. Um, wielding ref wielding refrigerator, a refrigerator on a stick, literally as as a gr as a great hammer. Yeah. Um. But what? How 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 do you um how do you represent that bonkersness within the within the encounters of of necromancer? Yeah, and um, so. I, I can I can definitely imagine, you know, per, perhaps the word bonkers oversells it in in regards to you know I can imagine more bonkers encounters where you can barely even tell what's happening because it's so alien or you know insane. Um, I I think what I was trying to depict is that it, it's at, at no point. Are you walking simply walking into a, a chamber, encountering some you know typical monsters and rolling for initiative? Like every encounter, there's something special about the encounter 
you know, the, the players need to complete a specific objective that becomes clear. Mm-hmm. The there's a there's a, a unusual monster with unexpected abilities. There's um you know something uh, there's some environment that they're in that completely changes how they're going to approach the the encounter and and if they don't take advantage of the props or the environment then the monsters will and you know we'll we'll make them pay for it mm. so that's that's sort of the 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 vision i was going for uh, uh, you know trying to make each encounter sort of like a cinematic action set piece where something it where it's it's going to be just a memorable event and you know afterwards uh you know the 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 players are going to be like oh do you remember that time when you know this or that happened and um you know then the 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 flying monkey showed up and then we, then the, then the bridge collapsed under us and then you know and so on and on right so that that was my goal yeah now when it now i in some cases when i've seen when i've seen adventures go that go at this go at this amount of length there's a couple um motifs that, that i've seen them go with one is um is treat is treat is treating in, is treating individual adventures within that campaign almost like almost like episodes in the campaign as a whole as the as the season of a te- of a television show the other is se- is separating the major parts of the in- of the campaign and I'm not going to ask for spoilers on this but treating the treating the o- treating the overall flow of the camp of the campaign almost with a almost with a axe structure um, right. Are any are either either or both of those kind of things present within Dawn of the Necromancer? Uh, maybe maybe a mix uh, of the two. I I think the um sort of the the adventure is broken into five parts, and mm-hmm. each of those parts sort of for the most for the most part represent a area that the are in you know to um kind of a a a, a contained sandbox area that they can do things advance the advance the story forward and that was one of my goals with this campaign was i always prefer sandbox style campaigns Mm -hmm. but at the same time that was one thing uh, that i found challenging going back to curse of strahd it's very sandboxy, but as a DM, you have so much latitude as to what to do, as do the players, that it, they they quickly end up either, in some cases, frustrated that they don't kind of know the path forward, and or they they end up blundering into areas that they're unequipped to deal with because they're too low le- of a le- of a level mm-hmm. so so i tried to, to first of all every every encounter in the campaign has a little section that gives advice on how to dial it up or down depending on not only the level of the of the players or of the characters but also um you know how how experienced the players are and if they're you know the there's just certain gaming groups that you know are like punching way above their weight, right? And and other groups that are that are maybe newer or more role play focused that are, are gonna have trouble with that same encounter level. So I I, I, I let the, the I give the GM, you know, an ability to sort of a slider to adjust the the encounters. But then also I've given some direction as far in terms of all right gm if if your players want to be led by the hand here's here's an ideal sequence of events in this area in this part of the ad- adventure that you can lead them through and you know they'll they're, they're going to progress nicely and enjoy what they're doing but at the same time 
it's a sandbox. You know, they can, I, I had one of my groups just altogether skip a major area of the campaign. And it, you know, the, it, it's engineered so that that wasn't a huge disruption to the overall story. Mm-hmm. Now, when it com- now another th- another thing that I often see with with this kind of structure is the is um more more emphasis on on in on individual encount individual encounters in some form and less fo- less focus on on full on full exploratory a la he- a la hex crawl approaches and to and to a certain degree not at not a not huge um mega dungeons. Um, now I'm get I'm guessing that there's going to be some form of dungeon crawl in this, but you're not dealing with um, a mega dungeon approach where there's ju- where there's just corridors on top of corridors on top of corridors. Um, Correct. Yeah. We're, we're not dealing with the Temple of Elemental Evil here. <laughs> yeah, or Dungeon of the Mad Mage, or or God yeah. or God help you, Tomb of Horrors. <laughs> yeah, there's there is some dungeon crawling. Uh, you know, there's a little bit of something for everybody. There there's some dungeon crawling. However, it's it's minimal, and um, uh, again, you know, it it, it it's it, that kind of that a, a big du- a mega dungeon kind of runs contrary to my goal, which was to make it sandboxy to to make it feel like the players really you know had some control over the direction of the story Mm -hmm. they had some effect over the the necromancer's plot uh you know just one of the one of the things that precipitated me writing this was a campaign that we had been uh my main main gaming group had been running uh, previous and I won't mention the the campaign, but it, it has a very linear, railroady approach. And at, at some point in the in the campaign, I just I, I, and I was a player in, uh, in this, and the 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 GM was doing a fantastic job, you know, running it as written. And at some point, I just called time out, and I and I said, okay. We, we all understand it's it's very obvious what this adventure wants us to do, but it's super it's also super frustrating because like it doesn't make any tactical sense. If we were really in this the situation, we would not do this thing that the adventure really really wants us to do. And uh, you know, everyone around the table agreed and is like, yeah, it's it's just. It's become unfun. It's so railroady, and so we kind of wrapped it up and abandoned that campaign. and And so, you know, I, I was, I, I wanted to write a, a a campaign that I that I would want to play in, and so that was one of the things I I avoided. Mm-hmm. And when it comes. When it comes to when it comes to the set the setting that you have of Ang- of Angromir, um, when it what I'm curious about is is that is that a, is that a setting that ha- that had got that had gotten a lot of play in your in your own table, or was it one that you cre- that you created specifically for um, Dawn of the Necromancer? So uh, yeah, so Argomir was a uh, it's sort of a homebrew setting that uh, that I've been fiddling with over the years. Uh, with Necro with Dawn of the Necromancer, I um, formalized mm-hmm. you know parts of it, and uh, however that um, setting is in the appendix of the book, and while the whole while the whole campaign uh assumes you're in that setting uh i also made it so that you could easily drop this campaign in your own favorite uh you know setting uh or home even a homebrew and it would be 
really easy to convert over. So, which I which I can I can certainly um, get I can certainly get behind that kind of thing. Um, I do I did find it kind I did find it kind of interesting that you're going with a mix of medieval Europe, but use but um using the Greek pantheon, and I'm 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 curious if it's a case of the your the the um people there worship the gods of the Greek pantheon, or is it a case of um Greek pantheon and all but name kind of thing? Yeah, good question. So the premise behind it is that. Let's assume that medieval Europe never embraced Judeo Christianity, but instead, um, you know, stuck with the the ancient Greek pantheon. What would it have looked? What would it have looked like with, you know, evolved hundreds of years later with um, th those those people in? in uh, the Middle Ages, and how how would the the Greek pantheon have have evolved? Mm -hmm. How would they view the the gods of it? And so it's not it's not the Greek pantheon in um, it's not just a, a a copy of it. It's like the literal pantheon. You know, it's uh, Apollo, Athena, uh, and so forth, and. I found that the players got pretty excited about that because everyone's already familiar with the story of of Greek mythology, and so uh, you know they they instantly knew which god they would want to worship and the backstory of that god, and like that already takes care of a bunch of the heavy lifting. Like you know you don't have people try, trying to pronounce what deity they they worship and look up the the that god's portfolio i mean everyone knows it and so uh it, taking that and then also incorporating some of the some of the funner tropes and monsters of of the, of greek mythology and kind of like you know putting them now in a uh, a later setting uh proved to be fun yeah um and give, given given that given that particular um, that particular setting, I'm cu I'm curious if you, if um if you've if you've expanded the player sandbox in any way when it comes to sub when it comes to subclasses that ref subclasses or backgrounds that reflect this setting, or if that's something you did you um opted not to focus on. Yeah, uh, so good question. Uh, the at the beginning of the campaign, there's I provide a a list of a bunch of little story hooks for individual characters, in terms of like you know hey you, you uh, this you, you just add this little piece to your backstory or you're from this location or you're familiar with these things, and to kind of get them invested from the beginning into the adventure. Mm. Uh, however, in terms of subclasses at present, there's no new subclasses. That was probably like the one rule area that I didn't play with, uh, in the campaign. If, if, if I get, you know, a bunch of, I've had a couple people ask about that. If I get a bunch of feedback that that's what people are looking for, I'd be cool with adding, adding it to the adventure there's still time mm. but and uh, that that wasn't uh, an objective i had going into it and when it now one one of the other things i'm one of the other things i'm curious about is the des the description of a of a sandbox style adventure and this is part of the reason why i alluded to um hex crawls which I still get the feeling that e even though this is a sandbox, it isn't a full-on hex crawl because it it'd be kind of hard to to ha to handle both at once unless you like spinning plates. Which, if you do, I'm not going to judge. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what? But how? But how do you accomplish the sa the sandbox part of it? Is it a, is it a case of tiers and tent pulls? 
So uh, my, my personal style as a game master is to, you know, if, if, regardless of how sandboxy a thing is, if, if I want the characters to encounter a certain thing, they're going to encounter it. Mm. So the, the way that I've engineered that in this campaign is, you know, you can, you can hex crawl around and you're going to encounter the things in a useful order in many cases regardless of what direction you're pointed you know what i mean like you've you've traveled you've traveled north for a day you you're you're about to encounter this thing you know and uh if you had traveled south for a day you would have encountered the same thing <laughs> so if that makes sense mm -hmm. and now when it come when it comes to the when it, comes, no, when it comes to the when it comes to destinations, because since you're de since you're dealing with the set the setting in full, um, I'm get I'm guessing that with that um that you have several chapters kind of de kind of detailing each ma each major location, and the other qu the other question that I have is, what is your take on the on the concept of wandering monsters, um. Within 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 modules. Yeah, I I I so personally I hate them. Like if I mean in terms of a random, you know, a random monster encounter. Like I I have no use for that. It if if I'm presented with a table of random monsters, I'm going to pick the coolest one. And that's what they're going to meet at, at a time of my choosing that's most interesting from a story perspective. So I, I would never leave something that critical to random chance. Especially, especially since that's a potential avenue for more for the dice gods to screw both sides over because Let's say you let's say let's say you use that table, you roll random chance, and then all of a sudden you have to justify a monster showing up in this area that norm that normally has that normally is completely out of their um, natural environment. Like say, and I'm I'm using this because this hap because this happened to me at one point. Um, you've got a bunch of people going in going in a forest area, and then all of a sudden, rust monster. <laughs> like, right. Like why? Why the hell would a rust monster be be in the middle of a forest? Um, I've sometimes I've sometimes seen it where a uh, where a rant where there'd be a random table and it, and the monster in quest and all in the middle of a forest. The monster in question is um a, is a bunch of skeletons, which I I've got no I've got no problem with with doing with putting skeletons in an encounter and it's certainly going to give the cleric something to do but at the same at the same time unless you unless you unless you have a good enough story reason um sometimes using those re and I'm pretty sure, I'm guessing this is the approach that you had with it sometimes using those in using those those kind of random tables results in mon results in monsters that don't quite fit Right, right. Um, yeah. So th th that's 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 why I, I, I take the approach I do, and you know I, I also um, provide a bunch of in in each in each part I provide a, a bunch of additional little story hooks or p possible encounters mm -hmm. that it, it, if the GM likes it they can expand on it and build something out of it. Uh, or, or if not, they can just skip it all together, you know, in, in part, um, because the, the campaign, uh, uses, um, prim is primarily designed to use milestone advancement. And, you know, while a GM could certainly choose to use X, an XP approach, um, I, I, I like the milestone approach from a, from a story perspective. For me, it's always about telling the story and, um, but if, if you wanted, uh, a slower 
pace adventure in terms of advancement, then you would need to use all of these additional hooks and encounter ideas that I give you to to feed it a you know to 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 pad it out. Otherwise, the at, you know every few sessions the players are going to be advancing, and uh, it, in in. But uh, you know, I, I understand some groups uh, m might like a, a more leisurely pace, and so they, mm -hmm. they have that option. Now, one of the things you put in the Kickstarter page is um, advice on how to adjust the difficulty. Because when I when I look at that, one of the first things that comes that comes to mind is my complicated relationship with chat with challenge rating in um, D in D and D. I was not. I'm not sure what your take on it, but I was never a fan of it back in third edition, and I'm regret. <laughs> I don't hate it as much as I did 20 years ago, but I'm not. I'm not exactly jumping for joy at it. Yeah. Yeah. So the so I include a I include the challenge rating because that's expected mm -hmm. and. So I think that, you know, being able to uh, adjust on the fly, the difficulty is important. And one, one of the things, one of the pieces of advice I give in the campaign is also if the players figure out a way to break your carefully calibrated encounter, then you should let them do that. Like they, that's, that's where they're going kind to of get fun mm -hmm. and excitement out of an encounter is by outs quote unquote outsmarting the the game master and you know dusting off some tactic or some spell that is going to completely neutralize the the villain and you know you should let them do that because that's that's the the fun part the engaging part of the of the story for for players yeah um it's i i think that what in what instantly comes to mind when you mention that whole breaking the carefully planned in, uh planned encount encounter is those instances when somebody um somebody realizes that there's a certain loophole in the rules that they could t that they could take advantage of or some kind of glorious dumb luck happens um in my in my own experience I've had um create I've had um creative uses of of meta magic so that i could so that i could multicast magic missile and turn it into a magic missile machine gun <laughs> <laughs> um right you know, just hold just hold all the spells until until the end and, the, and then completely blow away the blow away the boss with, with two with casting magic missile 200 times <laughs> and remember even though remember it does yeah, it's, yeah. Each magic missile is only doing a D4 in damage, but that doesn't really matter when you're doing 200 of them. And he, and my DM had basically said, "I am not having you roll four 200 caltrops. You're rolling <laughs> one D4, and you're multiplying that by 200." <laughs> right, right. Which may have not a, may have not been the best choice on his part because I ended up rolling a four for that. 
Of course. I, I knew where the story was going. So <laughs> he had so he had this whole set he had this whole setup of putting up a, putting us up against a against a against a beholder and the thing gets wiped out and one before he before the thing even has the chance to attack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, that and during my brief time with fourth edition, I before before they eroded it out, I had taken advantage of some of the interesting early um um two weapon ranger builds. One of which had a daily power that let you keep attacking as long as you kept hitting. Right. <laughs> you can see where this would become a problem. Yes. Yes. Definitely. Because. <laughs> I think after I think after the twenty third time that I managed to hit, my DM was like, "Okay, stop. He's already dead." <laughs> I was I was only doing again. I was only doing D six damage D six um, as my damage die each time. But 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 hey, if you if you fire enough bullets, you'll eventually hit something. Right. Well, and I think if if it's a case where the the player has figured out an exploit that they use mm -hmm. in every encounter then that's a little different you know the the game master needs to figure out a workaround or a, a way to deal with that but yeah. if 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 they if it's you know uh, specific to a, an encounter or uh something used only very occasionally then i don't have a problem with it you know and and it, and if it's like a boss type monster they're beating with it uh again i'm i'm cool with it you know the the last the the final campaign boss encounter uh th there's there's certain things in place to make sure that you know they don't one shot the big bad guy at the end yeah. but beyond that i i'm i'm cool with uh you know the occasional um fun encounter that just completely gets neutralized by crafty pcs mm -hmm. besides i i have a tendency i have in my particular style i have a tendency to put in to put in dumb or crazy th crazy things into into uh, campaigns and give and give them to players like i'm always a sucker for the very powerful but very di but very um <laughs> very unstable ki kind of kind of items mm -hmm. um i th like I put, I put in a sonic crossbow once as a magic as a magic item, with the catch that if you roll, whenever you attack with the thing, if you roll over fifteen, you ha you have to do a um you have to do a con save to make sure you don't to make sure you don't fall you don't fall in your ass, and I freely admit that the inspiration for it was the noisy cricket from Men in Black. <laughs> nice, yeah, exactly. Um, now. That, speaking of classes, that brings me to that brings me to one question that I often have when it comes to when it comes to utilizing st settings, especially the more non-standard, I guess they are. And that I that is class compatibility. Now, I get the feeling that mo that the majority of the base character classes and possibly some of the ones from from some of the, from some of the other books like Eberron are up are um are applicable for transfer but i'm curious if there are some that might be a little bit trick might be a little bit trickier to port over than others yeah uh, um you know i can, i i can't think of any class uh that that I've encountered that would either, you know, be game breaking or problematic for this campaign, honestly. To be honest, to be honest, when it comes to this, I'm, I'm when it comes to this and, ra and races included with this kind of thing, I'm not necessarily refer referring to um, referring to breaking in terms of game balance, but more of in terms of in terms of setting integration. Right, right. Uh, yeah. Again, I I I don't think that I I think you could you, you could feel pretty safe picking um most uh most any class um you know some races 
uh, a lot of the areas you you uh, pass through are pre are predominantly human, and so you know some uh, some races might uh, get a quizzical look or a little you know uh, a little trouble in that regard, depending on the circumstance. Mm. But um, you know it's the uh, the, the average human in the setting isn't like super racist or anything of that nature. So, uh, you know, it, it's a anything that is going to maximize the role play uh, fun. I, I try to incorporate, you know, and um, I, I understand that there's groups who where role playing takes the back seat to, you know, just brawling. And that's fine. I mean, I, I think they would have fun with the the encounters in this book. But for for the thoughtful role player, I, I try to create some really unique NPCs and social interactions that would, you know, uh, exercise their role playing chops and and create some moral conundrums to to sort of sort out, you know. Yeah. Now what now um unless I'm unless I'm mistaken, you're you're shooting for around two hundred around two hundred and fifty around two hundred and fifty pages. Yeah. You said you said that it's getting you said that it's that the adventure itself is split into five parts. Does that does that mean that there does that mean that you're dealing with five like chapters or acts or how how are how is it being set up? Uh, yeah, I mean, you could, you could consider them, you could consider them chapters. Uh, I don't know if it would always be a hundred percent obvious to the players that, oh, we've entered a new chapter, you know, here, here's the cutscene, you know, but, mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of naturally broken into those parts. So. All right. That, that's, that certainly makes, that certainly makes sense. Um, when, now, when it comes to, when it comes to the, uh, the, um, when it comes to some of the, some of the other, some of the other avenues, I know, I know I mentioned, I know I mentioned subclasses, but one particular avenue that, th that isn't go that is going to be significantly less crunchy in the character creation process that I'm wondering if there's some integration in this is backgrounds. Yeah, so um the 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 broader setting of Argomir would uh you know lends itself to pretty much any background if the player is willing to have traveled a far enough distance. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So uh so th there isn't any there isn't any background that you'd be like uh, that wouldn't make sense necessarily. Um, because th this uh, the the part of Argomir that this takes place in is called the Northern Kingdoms, and within the Northern Kingdoms, there's everything from cosmopolitan cities to um, little tiny hamlets to vast forests, and so you know pretty much any background would be uh, you know easy to incorporate into a. a, a character's backstory mm -hmm. now when it comes to th when it come now when it comes to the the um advent the adventure the adventure hooks um that that you have that you have um that you've hinted at on the on the page with some of these would they would they be more would they be more on the more on the lines of um of like a like side quest activities. Yeah, good question. So, um, there there's a handful of the major encounters that uh, you know I would sort of classify as side quests, and those are uh, those are noted, uh, and you know the the GM can decide how hard to push them or whether to even include them or not, um, and then. Many of the little uh, adventure hooks 
uh, you know, are, are, yeah, I would say either side quests or just things that you would encounter. And in the case of almost every encounter in the book, well, or, or at least many of them, you know, there's always a viable opportunity to bypass the encounter if they really, really want to. Um, in some cases, that's just physically impossible. But, it, you know, I, I had, uh, during the playtest, characters who would just opt to bypass encounter major encounters for whatever reason. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's engineered so that that's not going to completely disrupt the the campaign the story you know if if the players don't find this specific book the you know the the gm's going to have to figure out uh, some workaround you know that uh, i i avoided that in the campaign at all mm -hmm. costs so there's you know there's multiple ways to get any anything done that that the pcs are trying to do which i i can i can certainly go i can certainly go with that now with now um you had you had um you had you had been doing a fair you had been doing a fair amount of play testing when it comes to this in order to get in order to um get the balance out and tr and um get a bit more polish into the thing what were some of the big takeaways and some of the big lessons that you ended up learning during the year and change of uh, play testing oh yeah good question uh, let's see. So, um, one thing, one, one of the takeaways I had was, you know, I, um, I, I've done a little bit of screenwriting in the past and, and so I sort of have the philosophy that a, a good adventure is kind of like a fun movie, you know, that, that the, the players are in. And so I, I always opt for sort of, a, you know, and whenever possible, a, a cinematic solution. Um, and I, I found that while the, over the course of the campaign, while the characters, this is just, I guess, maybe a super mild spoiler, but mm -hmm. uh, while, while the characters were, were, would occasionally meet uh the the big bad necromancer or who they thought was that person um they weren't like I, I didn't feel like they were getting invested enough into the that that villain and so one thing i went back in and re-engineered was adding some dream sequences into the the campaign at, at specific points and so um basically they 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 function almost like you know a video game cutscenes where the 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 uh, one of the characters has this dream and can basically see the villain uh in sort of a, a little cutscene situation so they they can sort of establish a relationship uh and a, a connection with that villain and kind of be a little more uh, engrossed in the story, and uh, and that's explained in part by the fact that you know again going back to the Greek mythology, the Greek gods were very hands-on compared to other sorts of gods, and so in this campaign, the, the some of the some of the gods occasionally meddle with meddle in what's going on, and these these dreams being. An example of that, you know, kind of sh pushing chess pieces around the board to uh, accomplish some goal of theirs, or simply to, you know, screw around with <laughs> uh, the fates, you know, at, what, depending on on the uh, Wait, preference of the are, god. Are we? To yeah, it's important. It's important that you mention that, especially when you're using the word "screwing" and Greek gods in the same sentence. <laughs> you yes. know exactly where I'm going with that. 
Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We, we we don't delve too far. We don't develop delve too much into that, but uh, it is it is hinted at. I would say. Um, I'm just say, I'm just saying. I've I've made. I've made the I've made the meme I've made the meme many times of um of of a of a of a of, a, of shelves upon shelves of shelves upon shelves of books and you think is it, is it a library? No, it's a list it's a list of na it's a list of names of the names of all of Zeus's bastard children. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I I should have included more in in this in this adventure. Oh. I fear as te as tempting as as tempting as that might as that might have been um i don't think you i don't think you want i don't think you would want your adventure to be an to be another arm of of um tr of trying to do trying to do a a um greek epic in the tr in that particular approach especially since you're right. kind of going for alternative history you're not trying to go I don't think you want to retread antiquity in that in that particular regard. That for sure. I might, I might be reading too much of that into that, but that's just that's just me. Plus, some um, um, Theros already exists, so the so the whole so the whole antiquity style D and D is pretty well is pretty well covered, I think. And yeah, mazes and minotaurs has been has been around for almost a decade now, so there's that, <laughs> so there's that too. Yeah, I had started this campaign before I even, uh, well, I had I had it mostly written before I even knew Theros was, was a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, having looked at it, I, I'm not uh, too concerned about um, you know competition in that regard. And and, and I, I should say that you know maybe I'm overstating the whole mm -hmm. Greek uh, mythology angle. I mean, that's not like. The central focus, you no. know, of the campaign. Um, if any, if anything, it's the it's the um, backdrop, and you already you already mentioned that using that particular setting is optional. Right. Exactly. Um, now, I do want I do want to give my congrats for how quickly this got this got funded twice over. Um, with tw with um twenty nine with twenty nine days to go. When it when now um pres now presuming it presuming everything go everything goes as relative planned once the, once the once June fifth hits and just to make sure I don't do any jinxing. Um, <laughs> what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? So in in the Kickstarter, I talked about um, you know mid to late summer for the the printing of, of the of the hardcovers and so um you know it, with the success of the campaign already or the project i've been you know ordering artwork and working towards that um I, i've just been telling everyone you know by the end of the summer to to expect it but my strong preference is to under promise and over deliver. Right. So we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. I, I'm going to push to get this out the door sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll cert I'll certainly be keeping a close eye on how, and how it develops and congr congratulations. And I hope, I hope you managed to get to 20,000 before, um, before June comes along. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, but with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity at play here. <laughs> no, yeah, I've uh, I've enjoyed my my time in the monastery. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Fantastic. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, 
I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.